Kia ora koutou and welcome. We're very pleased to be here with you again for the Early Childhood Seminar Series in 2022. The seminar series this year will continue to focus on showcasing research of staff and students from the University of Auckland Faculty of Education and Social Work, ensuring the work of early childhood researchers and academics from further afield. Today, we're delighted to have you with us for the virtual launch of Professor Helen Hedges' latest book, Children's Interests, Inquiries and Identities. The recording of this presentation will be available on our Early Childhood Seminar Series YouTube channel after the seminar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask them, and Helen will respond to them at the end of her presentation, after which we will formally launch Helen's wonderful new publication. I will now pass over to Dr. Maria Cooper to welcome and introduce Professor Helen Hedges. Thank you, Justine. Tina uh, Tato Katoa. Talo Falava. It is my honor to introduce our colleague Helen Hedges, who is Professor of Early Childhood Education at our University of Auckland. Throughout her research career, Helen has encouraged teachers to think deeply about children's ideas, knowledge, and learning in early childhood curriculum and pedagogy. Her new book, Children's Interests, Inquiries, and Identities, reflects the deep knowledge Helen has developed and refined over the years regarding children's curiosities about the world and ways this learning can be supported by adults who are equally curious about the world. As will be evident in her book, Helen upholds a view of all children as capable thinkers, problem solvers, theorizers, and collaborators, whose ideas and question teach us so much about appreciating every opportunity given. Helen's work also shows deep respect for the complex work teachers undertake every day to ensure children are well supported in nurturing and thought provoking settings. As one of the invited writers of the revised Te Whareke, Helen is no stranger to the hard work involved in honing what may feel like a lifetime's worth of knowledge into a finite number of pages. She will now take us behind the cover of her book to pique our own curiosities about the wonderful world of children's interests, inquiries, and identities. Following Helen's presentation, we will have time for questions before I declare her book officially launched. And as Justine said, just a reminder to please add your questions in the Q&A and not the chat. So without any further delay, no mai, haere mai, and welcome, Helen. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Maria, for your kind introduction, and thank you, Justine, very much for this opportunity. Ko te mata peak toku monga, ko toku 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 awa, ko te moana nui a kiwa toku moana, ko hera tonga toku tūra no wai wai, kei te raki kai whenua a hau e noho ana, ko Helen Hedges taku ingoa, nō reiwa, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora, I'm Helen Hedges and thank you very much for coming to my virtual book launch. It takes the form of a presentation about key features and an overall argument of the book that we need to take children's interests seriously. I begin with this reminder from Dame Fina Cooper that whether as parents, grandparents, teachers or other professionals, the way we care for and empower children to grow and learn shapes theirs and our futures. One important acknowledgement in my book is to my own two children, Rebecca and Christopher. Playing with them when they were children inspired me to think deeply about the concept of children's interests well before I had the opportunity to study for a PhD and develop a research program. Last year, I brought all my research on children's and teachers' interests together for my book to offer fuller responses to the issues questions and provocations that had followed me from my first project. Given the prominence of children's interests in curricular policy and practice, I was surprised at how ill-defined children's interests were and how little was written about them even when I started out 20 years ago. Indeed, I found that the term children's interests 
was noted as an under-theorized catchphrase and part of early childhood folklore and practice. In addition, the provocation from Carl Bereiter on the slide that adults trivialize children's interests and that these are really about the activities of the moment has informed my research program in multiple ways. At the end of the first chapter, I suggest an order of reading the book related to who the reader is, whether a teacher, a parent, a policymaker, a student of early childhood studies or education, and so on. Today, I mainly focus on chapter content for students and teachers, given our typical seminar attendees. For this reason, I don't get back to fully answering these critiques in this seminar, but I certainly hope I do in the book itself. Chapter one starts where it counts with children and in particular Jack and his family. I met Jack and his mother and teachers when he was two. Jack told me, I know all about moons and stars and planes and boats. Teachers told me his interests were manipulative activities, the swings, books and music. During an interview at his home, Jack's mother said that boats, cars and trucks had been a major interest of his for some time. Then, while the focus on boats continued, a focus on language and literacy through books and audio tools was prominent. At the time of the home interview, there was also a focus on carpentry tools and activities, from which he later used the skills learned to make a small boat. Much of this interest was prompted by what was happening at home. For example, the family was restoring a yacht. Aged four, Jack engaged with a long-term project at his kindergarten around the Titanic. This involved drawing and writing as new meaningful activities. Jack's mother sent me an email about Jack on this slide that shows how powerful interests can be. His portfolio has a record of him making a wooden Titanic boat and over a month later, bringing it back to kindergarten for some modifications, another funnel. Theresia also used the Titanic obsession to get Jack drawing, something he'd never been much interested in. The drawings we have from that period are my most treasured drawings from his time at kindergarten. There is a Titanic series, over 15 I would guess. They mostly focus on the funnels, with smoke and propellers with churning water. There is also one in his kindergarten portfolio of the submarines, including his first written word other than his name, submarine. Titanic was also one of his first written and recognized words. Here, in the words of a child and a parent, and the responses and actions of thoughtful teachers, the potential of interest-based learning is shown. Many years later, Jack's mother came to my professorial inaugural address and told me that Jack at the age of 18 had decided to study marine engineering. At present, I understand he has aspirations to work with Team New Zealand. I am sure that you know people like Jack and his family. In these narratives of real human lives, we find the kernel of wisdom about the power of children's interests and how important it might be to ascertain accurately what these are in order to support and encourage interests that lead to long-term outcomes and adult identities. I mentioned my own two children earlier. Rebecca is now a primary school teacher. And yes, she did play schools frequently with her dolls and toys and slightly unwilling brother. Chris is now a scientist and yes, among his childhood interests, he did show a keen and continuing interest in science. In my research, when children, parents or teachers are asked about children's interests, they immediately talk about the activities that children show a preference to participate in. Here are examples of what I have been told. Imogen likes to play on the swing. Tom is always building with Mobilo. Hunter is an expert at playing the drums. Simeon wants to play soccer. Chloe enjoys trying to jump. Zoe likes reading books. 
and Campbell knows all about sharks and whales. In my book, however, as Jack's story indicates, I argue that activities and topics in themselves are important, but potentially surface level and limiting understandings of the term children's interests. We owe it to children to look more deeply at their motivations and learning. The term children's interests has suffered and in some places still suffers from narrow interpretations connected with play activities. What is clear through much literature and many curriculum documents worldwide is that developmental theory and child-centeredness remain dominant in supporting an emphasis on activities. So what are the problems with this, you may ask? Well, first, early studies were experimental. They defined interests as activities individual children chose from a small number of activities that were already pre-selected by adults and put in a strange or new room. Can anyone spot the problems here? What a huge leap it is to define the activity selected as an interest, or conversely, what a narrow interpretation of interest that is. These studies were used, however, to support the long-standing commitment to child-centered practices and curricular provision as encompassing a wide range of play activities for children to choose from. So these studies created a circular justification for a commitment to play, child-centeredness, and provision of activities. Yet Chung and Walsh also noted over 20 years ago that there are more than 200 confusing and different meanings of child-centeredness. The good point about child development theories and child-centeredness are that children are central to most teachers' thinking. However, these have been soundly critiqued as Western constructs that deny equity inclusion and inclusion. Studies in other contexts have found different progressions and foci depending on context. In addition, these ideas position teachers as environment designers, resource providers, and facilitators, leaving teachers wondering about what it means to be a teacher. So as noted, when asked about interests, children, parents, and teachers often mention favorite activities first. So don't get me wrong, play and activities are very important for children's learning and development. They are the tools and materials that create spaces for learning and development. But I argue that they're not the full picture of children's interests and curriculum alone. They can sit alongside other concepts that teachers can use to understand children's interests more deeply and inspire and create curriculum and pedagogy. Next, I want to illustrate the point that equity and inclusion means that children can only select from what adults have provided. Many centres place great emphasis on providing inviting environments for children. Sometimes they look almost too good to engage with, but perhaps they're questionable at times about how they relate to children's lives. Here, I ask an important question about that. In this photo of Ching Ching, we see her walking a doll around in a buggy while wearing pink fluffy high heeled shoes. What messages are here? I knew she had a new baby brother, so asked her about him and how her mother cared for him. In the conversation, she told me that her mother carried the baby in a sling all day, but that there wasn't a sling at kindergarten. Instead, she was clearly copying what she had seen other peers do in denial of her own family's cultural ways of caring. So this point illustrates that children can only choose from an environment pre-selected by adults in terms of what has been purchased and made available. And so it provides one reason in itself to look more deeply at play and interests and partnership with families. Just before I do that though, next, I'll take just a little time to explain a few foundational points the book argues for and or is grounded in. In a theory chapter, 
I outlined the powerful and misunderstood relationship between interests and learning that have contributed to interests perhaps being trivialized in early childhood education and certainly overlooked for their value in schooling. Much of this rests on the assumption that informal learning is somehow inferior to formal learning. In contrast, I return to Dewey's original work on interest and to develop ideas from contemporary scholars that show a deep definition of interest and the powerful relationship between interests, curiosity, inquiry, and informal learning, as the Pecran quote on this slide shows. At the end of the chapter, I develop eight new principles for understanding children's interest-based learning. In a chapter about policy and practice, I engage with debates about the purposes and approaches of the early years. Throughout the book, I engage with school readiness debates and attempt to articulate how and why curriculum and pedagogy built on interests and holistic outcomes such as learning dispositions and working theories can speak back to school readiness policies and practices. Such arguments are complex and require teachers to have in-depth professional knowledge and research findings to cite in order to engage in school readiness discussions with colleagues in the early childhood and schooling sectors, leaders, parents and policy makers. I have worked to provide arguments and evidence in accessible ways through examples in the book. My book is founded in sociocultural theory as it can help explain the origins and outcomes of interests, fosters a more active and intentional role for teachers to play during interactions and engagements, and a relational pedagogy that views children's and teachers' interests of value. It also provides a foundation for my relational and ethical approach to researching children's interests and a rationale for studies to have long periods of field work. So, how then might we look differently at children's interests? What theories and concepts are examples of what's been valuable in my work? How might these help families and teachers to understand and respond to children a little differently? Chapter five describes my application of funds of knowledge to the early years. Funds of Knowledge was a first effort at culturally responsive pedagogy designed to redress deficit views of linguistically and culturally diverse families. The original project occurred in Mexican Latino communities in Arizona in the 1980s. The theoretical concept is based on the view that all people have competence from their rich life experiences. Funds of knowledge, then, are cultural and historical resources that families build and use from focusing on their own functioning and well-being. Children participate in funds of knowledge-related activities every day. One example of funds of knowledge embedded is for a child at home to help with creating a shopping list, shopping at a local supermarket, preparing, serving, and eating a meal as a family. This is the kind of activity we often see children represent, represent, and recreate in their play, and we could engage with more deeply in relation to their family and cultural knowledge and expertise. Funds of knowledge is also a me methodological concept deriving from the discipline of anthropology. Early projects involved teachers visiting some families where power relationships and assumptions were addressed and important cultural knowledge families take for granted brought to light. As a pedagogical concept, funds of knowledge can also be utilized in education in culturally relevant and meaningful ways that respect family values and family knowledge. I'll share one significant example. Hunter was a Pasifika child who teachers thought was silent and shy. 
but they were strongly aware of his interest in music. When teachers shared our project video data with his mother, conversations helped them become more aware of the rich background and cultural significance of music to the family that helped to explain his talent and skills. His parents were incredibly proud that this interest had been recognized. The centre purchased new real drums for Hunter to teach his peers how to play. But through a home visit, so much more was learned about his family, their ways of living, and the values that underpinned these. The visit then also ensured that curricular planning moved beyond potentially low level activity based responses and resisted potential stereotyping. Here is part of a teacher memo about the home visit. Before the visit, I had assumed that in Hunter's home, three languages were spoken, English, Samoan and Cook Island Māori. However, I learned that English is the main language spoken along with a little Cook Island Māori. Both parents valued English as the best language to speak because of the perceived link to having a good education. It is only now they are able to revive some of their home languages and encourage Hunter to learn these. I believe that invisible barriers were broken down by this visit. It counteracted some of my assumptions about Hunter's family and transformed the relationship I had with them until he went to school. So as you see, the visit as the, as with the original studies was transformative in countering assumptions and building stronger relationships. The empowerment Hunter gained from having his interests recognized helped both Hunter and his family develop deeper relationships with teachers. Hunter adopted the identity of drummer boy. He used the confidence and manner of this identity to expand his repertoire of play activities in the center beyond music. He also developed a stronger disposition to learn that he transferred to other areas for the first time, a disposition that would likely carry him confidently into schooling. Here, you see the beginning of another argument that's developed in the book, that a deeper interpretation of children's interests is not only about the potential for learning, but as with Jack, also relates to identity development. Zoe and Chloe are two other children who feature about funds of knowledge, and at other times in the book, as a way to show that various deeper lenses on interests at different times are valuable. I'm going to offer one example for each of those two children and what follows as further lenses on interests. Remember Baraita's provocation about us trivializing children's interests? I was really taken by Gordon Wells' idea of children's real questions. The serious and sometimes existential questions that they have that are of genuine interest to them and lead to inquiring deeply into what is meaningful to them. I've used this idea to interpret findings to locate what might be driving what was represented in activity and continuing topic interests. This idea forms part of chapter six. These real questions are not children's words, but interpretations of what children represented as interests across a wide range of different play experiences and activities. I argue that these should be the foundation of early childhood curriculum through relational pedagogy. Here are the most recent versions of these questions that were built with co-researchers, including teacher researchers. The overarching question is how can I build personal, learner and cultural identities as I participate in interesting, fulfilling and meaningful activities with my family, community and culture? Seven questions summarize interests that lead to this fundamental question. What can I do now I am bigger that the older children do? What do intelligent, responsible and caring adults do? 
How can I make special connections with people I know? How can I make and communicate meaning? How can I understand the world I live in? How can I develop my physical and emotional well being? How can I express my creativity? To apply these questions, an example follows. Here is four year old Zoe, an eager participant in her family and early childhood centre. At the activity level, she enjoyed reading books, drawing pictures, writing, playing with dolls, and participating in carpentry projects. As a continuing interest, Zoe was interested in language and the power of language through, for example, creating her own imaginary language with her friend Isabella. In recording a child-friendly interview with a teacher researcher, Zoe revealed a number of aspects of her interest from her home too. She told us a lot in this short piece. I like drawing and I like playing mum and dads because what I like about that is I really want to be a mum when I grow up and a police officer because I've been playing with my doll babies a lot and I've got good things to look after babies, bottle, foods and cream and some water and a high chair and a push chair. Did you know when I went to the swimming pool on Friday, I saw two cars parked on the yellow lines and you're not allowed and I told them off. They parked the car there and you're only allowed to park where you can. So I told the people off. And on Friday, same Friday, we went to fix the windows because they were breaking windows and burglars usually break windows instead of knocking on doors and that's stealing. So that's just a small part of our interview. Zoe's mum explained to us this, this excerpt was a mix of experience and imagination. Certainly though, as you can see, Zoe saw herself as someone who had good understandings of adult roles and responsibilities. The fundamental inquiry questions on this slide about identities, adult roles, and responsibilities, connections with people and communicating meaning, explain Zoe's interests across all of the data in a deeper and more analytical way that teachers could then support differently and beyond simply providing activities. And they did. By the way, at age 11, Zoe planned to be an architect as a responsible and contributing adult. She planned to have a husband but said he would need to be quite good at cooking as she would be busy at work. She's now 13 and most recently told us, I want to be an orthodontist or a world famous baker with a cake shop. I'd like to have three kids so the oldest doesn't have to hang out with the youngest all the time and find a house with a big garden and a swimming pool. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> Her mum told me, Zoe continues to think and talk about what she wants to do and be when she is an adult. At this stage, her aspirations are divided between doing something she thinks will earn her money, the orthodontist, orthodont being an orthodontist, or so she can afford a house with a proper a big garden and a swimming pool, or doing something she really enjoys, the baking. Her comment about having three children reflects her current experience of having one little brother who follows her around a lot. Funds of identity is a concept that has developed from funds of knowledge to explain which broad experiences people find of relevance and interest and therefore take up to define themselves and determine their directions in life. Also in chapter six then, I offer examples of Zoe's learner identity and potential adult identities analyzed from findings interpreted as fundamental inquiry questions. I also include the role of agency and imagination. Children's curiosity, interests and inquiries are often expressed as working theories. These, of course, are one of two interrelated holistic learning outcomes in our New Zealand curriculum document, Te Whāraki. 
and I write about both outcomes in several places in the book. At this point, though, I talk about working theories from Chapter 7. Working theories as a concept describes children's significant, complex, cognitive, embodied, and communicative efforts to make sense of their worlds and revise participation and actions as their understandings mature due to new experiences and knowledge and through their increasing physical and verbal capabilities. And I'll illustrate that next. Toddler Chloe was a child who was an eager and active observer and participant with peers and older children. She enjoyed being in an early childhood setting where children aged six months to five years played and learned together in their environment. Older children often adopted a tuakana or mentor role to assist Chloe in her learning. It's helpful for you to know that funds of knowledge were involved in the interest explained here. Her family loved sports in the outdoors and Chloe was often at the park on weekends. So careful and supportive risk-taking was a part of her life at home and at the centre. Her teachers certainly viewed her as competent and capable and worked hard to support her learning and creating an appropriate environment. As I explain next, over a period of six months from the age of 17 months to 23 months, Chloe acted on her interest in learning to jump. Something we may overlook in relation to its complexity because developmental theory would have us believe it's natural and most children achieve it. Chloe's learning reflected the fundamental inquiry questions of what can I do now that I'm bigger that older children do, and how can I develop my physical and emotional well being? So, these slides have photos taken from video footage on three different occasions. Chloe showed her interest in learning to jump, and over these six months, developed an, an, an increasingly complex and useful working theory of what was involved to achieve her goal. Analyzing her learning as a working theory in progress shows the complexity of something we take for granted. On the first occasion, Zoe was in the sandpit. She was encouraged by a teacher to bend her knees and enacted a bouncing movement, although her feet didn't move. Her teacher then encouraged her to stand on the raised edge of the sandpit with her feet facing inwards, so there was a short drop. Chloe thought carefully for some time, raised her shoulders up and down a few times, and eventually stepped into the sand pit, sand pit one foot at a time. On the second occasion, Chloe climbed a ladder to a box. She stood there briefly, then worked out how to lower, her, lower herself backwards onto a second box that had a mat below it. She had by this time also observed older children jumping on the mat, and she clearly indicated she wished to do the same. Again, she carefully stepped to the front of the box with both feet, bent her knees, but then effectively dived head first onto some bean bags that the teacher had placed there, concerned that Chloe might not yet be sufficiently proficient for a mat. Chloe picked herself and her hat up without fuss and climbed up again for another attempt. This time she thought and hesitated, then turned around and climbed down backwards. On the third occasion, recorded three months later, Chloe clearly initiated the activity herself as no specific jumping activity had been set up by teachers and no older children were present. She purposely ran to climb a closed in ladder, climbed onto the edge of a box and looked down. She said, jump please, and a teacher acknowledged that she wanted to jump. She then asked the closest teacher to get her a mat. She watched intently as a mat was put down in front of her, appeared to make a careful judgment about its size and positioning and said, two mats. 
a second map was brought over and placed beside the first one. The teachers counted one, two, three. Chloe concentrated for a few more seconds and then jumped competently onto the mat, this time landing on her two feet. What a celebration of something that is apparently simple and natural. Breaking down Chloe's working theory of how to learn to jump into its components, as the research team did for this slide, illustrates the depth and complexity of children's learning. All of this when Chloe was not yet two years of age. I'll give you a moment to read the knowledge, skills and strategies, attitudes and expectations involved. From this list, to pull out literacy and numeracy as commonly prized subject knowledge in curricular jurisdictions that focus on academics, Chloe's accurate understanding and demonstration of knowledge of plurals and beginning supervising of the number two, both related to simply requesting two maths, are quite sophisticated. In a school readiness jurisdiction, whether this kind of early literacy and numeracy would be recognized through the kinds of testing and assessment regimes used is however doubtful. Further, these are just two of the pieces of high level learning Chloe demonstrated that are on this slide. Working theories are then an example of ways holistic learning outcomes enable recognition of meaningful learning related to children's interests. Children's interests do not emerge from nowhere to suddenly be visible in play activity choices as adherence to some narrow views of child-centeredness suggest. So I now turn to inspiring and responding to children's interests, specifically to emphasize the role of teachers. I encourage a shift from the simple dichotomy of child-centered and teacher-led to explore interests in a relational pedagogy. In chapter eight, I write about the reanalysis of four projects where I found that teachers' interests contributed many of the experiences provided, but were way less frequently documented than children's interests. During interviews, the teachers revealed that documenting teacher interests was in tension with their child-centered or child-initiated philosophies. Yet there were multiple examples where teacher interest, expertise and knowledge enriched children's experiences and provided curricular activities and projects that went well beyond what children could achieve if left to typical and narrow child-centered notions of interests. At my seminar on teacher interests last year, I explained the example of teacher Daniel, who was a former engineer. Using his expertise and child Peter's interest in building a treehouse, Daniel encouraged planning and participation over several months. But he expressed tensions and dilemmas through an idea used in the literature as well, a fear of hijacking children's interests. He wrestled with how to have input to achieve children's goals without taking the power of interest away from them. This wrestling is reflected in his comments on this slide. While Daniel resolved his dilemma, how many other teachers do not? How many still interpret children's interests as emerging somehow from children's uninterrupted play? and feel a need perhaps to counterbalance these with teacher-directed activities, sometimes encouraged by narrow ideas in some international curricular policy documents and research. I argue then for a repositioning of teachers' interests 
to move away from these dominant, dominant interpretations of child-centeredness. Findings exemplify provision of more challenging, authentic and responsive environments than traditional play activities as a result. This is all possible without removing children's enjoyment of play or redirecting child-centered play for pedagogical purposes. I therefore make an argument that it's important for teachers' interests to be legitimized and that these ought to be reflected in considerations of teacher knowledge, I then go on to discuss in the same chapter. Verity Campbell's Barr's work is prominent among many scholars researching and advocating for increasing professionalism through studies of teacher professional knowledge or knowledges, knowing, agency and identity. Campbell Barr suggests that choosing to be an early years professional is like choosing to study for several di different degrees at once, drawing on psychology, sociology, biology, social policy, and more. In addition, there are the challenges of learning to be patient and empathetic. And then on top of that, you need to know about children's interests, such as dinosaurs, deep sea creatures, wildflowers, insects, fairies, cars, the list could go on. Appreciating the intricacies of professional knowledge and skills in the early years is therefore about celebrating just how much early years professionals know. So in the book, I relate early childhood teacher knowledge to long influential models such as Lee Shulman's in order to argue that early childhood education requires a similar knowledge base to all other teaching sectors. A further idea I include is that of Kate Ward and Joss Nuttles. They offer the concept of embodied knowing, a concept aligned with knowledge for action that brings to the fore the implicit role that knowledge plays in pedagogical decision making. They argue that this is an appreciation that grows with experience as a teacher, and that over time, teachers can increasingly and fluidly relate to children, families, and colleagues without first consciously stopping to think about the knowledge required to do so. Exciting work teachers do. In chapter nine, I trace the genesis and trajectories of five young adults' interests through their early childhood primary and secondary schooling, tertiary education studies, and early career choices. I then argue that interests have not received enough attention in the few longitudinal studies of early childhood education. I argue again that they're a powerful mechanism for learning with strong identity-based outcomes. In this chapter, I place an emphasis on learning dispositions as an important outcome of interest-based learning. I also show that learning dispositions support interests to continue when at times interests were not being supported elsewhere. And also at critical life junctures all the way through to early adulthood. The book finishes with a chapter bringing all the arguments together and offers two models. It's been an exciting and challenging writing project so it's also very exciting to be at the stage of it being published in 10 days time. On amazon.com, you can read part of chapter one. Their price though is dearer than the publisher's price. So if you're interested or want to recommend to a center librarian or a university librarian, sorry, a center leader or university librarian to purchase it, please make the most of the discount code on this flyer by ordering direct through the publisher. Having written a whole book, I do feel like I've skimmed the contents as an overview today. So welcome your questions and comments soon and later by email if you do take the time to read the full book. Before I finish though, I want to offer this whakatoki, the one I use in the acknowledgements that actually front the book. E haru takitoa he takitahi my successes are not mine alone. They represent the successes 
that come from support and collaboration. My research has relied on the support and collaboration of many, many people. I thank sincerely all the teachers, families and children who have generously opened themselves up to my research. I've learned so much from you all. I also thank teacher researchers and co-researchers in projects and the young adults in the study of their interests. I also acknowledge my own university colleagues and New Zealand and international colleagues for their expertise and for stimulating readings, provocations and dialogue. I was delighted that four international colleagues wrote endorsements for the book, including two who were part of the critique that I shared at the beginning of this presentation that set me on this trail of research. Maria Burberley and her colleague had said the term children's interests was an under-theorized catchphrase, and Marilyn Flair and colleagues that it was part of early childhood folklore and practice. Their endorsements on this slide that I believe are on the back cover show that they seem happy with where I got to in my book. Finally, here are some take home messages as you continue your commitment to children's interests. As I note in the introduction to my book, whichever way you approach it, whichever chapters you choose to read in whichever order, I want to thank you for being interested in knowing more to support children's interests, learning, life experiences, education, inquiry, and identity building. Thank you for listening to this presentation and being here to launch my book. Noho ora mai. Over to you, Maria. He patai. Oh, ngā mihi mahana, uh, Helen. Oh, oh, clearly the book highlights children as the real stars of your research and sounds like a valuable uh, research for EC teams to have. Um, just encouraging people to think about the questions they might put up in the Q&A. And uh, because there's nothing there yet, while we give you time to put those questions up, Helen, perhaps we could start by you talking a little bit more about the school readiness aspect that you mentioned uh, in your presentation. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, because the book needed to be for international audiences, I took the time to look at some of the international policy and practice. Uh, and I mean, we think of things like the, I think it's the early learning study that the OECD wanted to have many, many countries participate in, but only three did in the end, um, one of which was, was England. And I do use a lot of English research in the book because you know their curriculum is much more academically oriented than ours. I I guess we're starting. We've seen a little a uh, little shift in language over time. A little bit of creep with our own early childhood sector. Um, when we weren't looking, everything changed to being called early learning, mm -hmm. and I think you know that label in itself is is less holistic and perhaps uh, neglects some of the care elements and some of the ethical orientation to teaching that we encourage in our student teachers. Um, and, you know, risks a real focus on learning being that whole idea of something that is more teacher directed and focusing on school readiness. I think with Te Whareke, we've also, you know, perhaps thought we were a little bit sheltered from some of that um, and more like the Nordic countries. So in the OECD reports, they often uh, contrast more academically oriented curricula from what they call social pedagogic and they put uh, te whāraki in the social pedagogic but also countries like Scandinavia. So I was a little bit perturbed when I um, started reading more widely to find that countries in Scandinavia are also finding just a little bit of policy creep coming in around school readiness. So I think it's something we need to be perhaps a little more aware of and therefore, it's not just about parents asking, you know, why don't you teach my child to read? It's actually about having discussions that, and evidence that we can use with, um, as I said, I think parents, policymakers, colleagues, leaders 
to have these discussions about how is it that the curriculum we use and our holistic learning outcomes are addressing the kinds of things that these documents are emphasizing. And so in this presentation, that's particularly why I showed how complex Chloe's learning was and what seems a very simple and natural activity is wanting to learn to jump. There was so much built in there that that might not be noticed if we had um, a more of a school readiness approach. So yeah, just something I think our teachers need to continue to be aware of and um, start developing uh, good arguments for. Yeah, yeah, there's certainly more global pressures for us to think about and um, yes. develop ways to articulate, talk back to some of those pressures. Um, great. Uh, just uh, there is a just a comment in here if you can pop up the discount code again is it oh. possible for you to share the slide and then I've got another question for you wow that's an exciting question <laughs> yeah now the question is which one is it let's find out I can go backwards again and it was the flyer on its own I know but what happened was I ended up with two lots of sharing and that's why it wouldn't start at the beginning oh, okay. ah! So I'll, I'll try it this way. <laughs> it doesn't want to play, does it? Here we go. Thank you. Thank you to whoever asked that question. <laughs> it was, um, okay, and just a, a comment. Yes, you're getting some great feedback. Um, exciting work, amazing work from a couple of people in there. One of the questions I have is uh, that clearly you've learned so much from your research and from children uh, about children's interests and some of that work informs the book. What did you enjoy revisiting uh, from those projects as you were writing this book? Oh, well, as you said at the start, for me, it's, it's always been about the children and um, to, to revisit some of the data that I've had from um, projects before our shared one and then our shared one and to look at some of that material again and kind of reinterpret it with, with more lenses as I've gone along in my research. So the, the new one that I presented today was about funds of identity. Uh, but another idea that I use throughout the book uh, is one I've become really interested in, and that's the idea of capability theory. And just to explain a little bit about that, uh, which relates to the purposes of early childhood education and speaking back to school readiness, there's often been an economic investment argument for early childhood education, that if we invest early, we have better long-term life, social, economic outcomes later on. That is what encourages the school readiness discourse, you know, the, the likes of James Heckman and other economists. But um, there's another economist called Amartya Sen, who was Indian, and uh, came up with this idea of capability theory, which is, has a much more positive spin on the kind of holistic learning that children do. So, that's another new idea that I've kind of woven um, through the book because it has good fit with the image of children as competent and capable, both in Tefatiki and in the kind of messages that I'm trying to get to convey about children's capabilities and, and yeah, just how, how, how great children are if we take the time to um, be really careful with that. Mm. Yeah, and pay attention and, and all of those good strategies. Um, so we're still waiting to see if there's any other questions. And while we, we are waiting, I've got another one uh, for you. This is a tricky one, but I guess this is part of the realities of and the complexities of teaching. How might teachers engage with those interests that involve what some might consider to be antisocial aspects? Right. So for example, a child's deep interest in doll play and exploring all of that, um, that intentionally excludes others? Mm, mm. Well, doll play that intentionally excludes others. I'd have to think about, but I can tell you about another example in the book. Yeah, that'd be great. Right. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is a child who, from her 
family background. So I try to explain that funds of knowledge is not in itself a panacea for understanding children's interests because yes, teachers may again feel torn about what those funds of knowledge bring to the early childhood setting. Um, and the example that I share in the book is about a child who has quite gender-based um, working theories from her funds of knowledge and just how that is difficult for, for teachers. And of course, you've reminded me that one of the big challenges I was offered very early on when I started talking about uh, this, these kinds of ideas was a, a, a professor who was at our faculty who asked me, you know, what, what if the family is running a, a tinny house? Mm. And so, yeah, you know, your question about what if they're engaging in doll play, but they're excluding others. You know, there's probably some things going on from, from home there that teachers do need to figure out and know about um, and how do you do that sensitively and then kind of come back and encourage a child to look at, well, you know, yes, we understand that that's, you know, one way of learning and gosh, look at what this child's doing and, and um, you know, how might we approach that differently? So teachers do have a responsibility to not simply accept what comes from home, but to filter that through what are the principles and strands of Te Whāraki. And um, of course, yeah, and on some occasions, of course, to, to talk to parents about what is happening and come, come to grips with it. But also, I was reading something actually just on the weekend um, about how parents sometimes appreciate early childhood education as a source of help for their parenting. So, you know, there might be some, some ideas or thoughts in amongst that that teachers could pick up on. Yeah, and I guess that goes back to your idea not to think of children's interest in a superficial way, but there's huge ethical dimensions to them as well as professional judgment and negotiating, you know, whose interests we yes. look at and uh, together. So um, here is a question from Joanna Williamson. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. The concepts of mana and identity being central to te whāriki and to this work, well, they are central to this work, I wonder if you can speak to the importance of making some specific visible links to te whāriki learning outcomes for the New Zealand context. For example, external evaluation looking for highly visible links. Right. So okay. the two examples that I have used throughout the book are the two overarching concepts of learning dispositions and working theories because they are the two overarching ones and because they are the two that are in the international literature as well. Um, I do mention mana at the beginning of the book because that is so central to Te Whāraki. I don't develop it in the book because it was designed for... Um, an international audience. Um, and I do touch on agency and identity in chapter six around the funds of identity. However, those are things then that uh, centers could, could use the basic, the basic ideas that are there to explore further. And I've certainly talked about, um, you know, it's the whole thing of so much research, so little time of wanting to expand ideas about other learning outcomes. And now there's, you know, another 18 in Te Whāraki and matching those to children's interests. Mm -hmm. I think some of that may come um, by going back to what I said about the fundamental inquiry questions being the basis of um, curriculum and relational pedagogy. Because when I look at the wording of some of those, I can see some close connections with some of those 18 outcomes. So I think the potential is there. And um, I would certainly love to hear more from centres who are trying to do that and to, you know, to have some dialogue about that. And I expect, Joanna, that that means I will with you. <laughs> and that's fine. I look forward to it. Mm, great. Thank you, Helen. Um, we have run out of time for additional questions because I now need to move to actually officially launching the book. Um, if you do have additional questions, Helen's on email at h.hedges at auckland.ac.nz. She would love to hear from you. Oh, I want to thank everyone for making time to support this wonderful achievement of Helen's. And I have the honour of now declaring the book officially launched. 
um, as we consider raising our virtual glasses to Helen's achievement. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. I will now hand back to Justine for our closing comments. Adam Maria, and thank you, Helen, for sharing from your new book this evening and launching it with our early childhood seminar series audience. And we wish you every success with the book. And I'm sure that based on what you've shared this evening, that our audience will be very keen to read children's interests, inquiries and identities for themselves. And I will certainly be um, recommending it to our students as a very useful source for them. So thank you. Uh, we hope that everyone watching has found this introduction to Helen's book thought provoking and that it's provided inspiration for your own practice and thinking about children's interests, inquiries and identities. And if you need a reminder about where you can purchase a copy of Helen's book, please do check out our YouTube channel. So we look forward to seeing you all back for our next seminar, which will be on Monday the 4th of April with a cross-institution team of researchers who have been exploring conceptualizations of teachers' hawara and wellbeing. So keep an eye on your inbox for the flyer and registration information. And thank you again for joining us this evening. Kia kaha, kia ora, kia atafai, ka kite anō.